Hello, everybody. It's Kelly and Jim from the X-Files Preservation Collection, and we are thrilled to be speaking with Karen Canaval. Hello, Karen. How are you? I am good, Kelly and Jim. It's so great to see you guys. It's awesome to see you. It's been a while. Last time we saw you was at that convention in Chicago. That's right. Yes. And I loved, I loved um, everything you did with them. Um, it was like you created a museum there already. And, and I went excitedly from one exhibit to the next exhibit around the room. I was like, I think I was like a kid in a candy store looking yeah. at everything you guys had there. I was completely blown away. So now that you're doing this even larger thing, I go like, oh my God, I can hardly wait to see what it's like and to visit one day. It'll be so wonderful. So wonderful. Can't wait to share. That's our favorite part, seeing everybody everybody's reaction right. when they see it the reaction yeah definitely okay so we usually start our our questions with how did you get involved in acting how did i get involved in acting well i wasn't it like you know a lot of people get involved in uh they do theater in high school or something like that or whatever and that was not my life at all i was i was originally trained as a dancer and when i was in high school i was like in high school in the mornings and then six or seven hours a day in uh, uh, really serious classical ballet training in the afternoon. And I was apprenticing with a company as well. So um, um, that's what I was doing when I was in, um, in, in grade 12 and stuff. And, um, and then somewhere along the way that year, I, I realized that, that it, as much as I love dancing, it wasn't gonna become a career for me that had um, like really big legs on it. I, I don't know, no, no pun intended. I just realized what I said there. Um, but like that it was, it was, it was probably going to be somewhat limited. So um, when I was 16 and I graduated from high school, I quit dancing and I went to university and decided to become a translator for the United Nations. So I went into an honors language course at university and on the side, I just took some acting course, like improv courses and some theater history. And a couple months in, I, and then I started to do little productions in the first year of university, uh, in different things, I think Midsummer Night's Dream and a couple of other things. And then I suddenly went, huh, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. So I changed, I changed my, uh, my honors language degree to a theater history degree, which would make it shorter. And also, so then I could go to theater school when I graduated and um, I continued to do, um, you know, stay involved in acting stuff and be part of the choir and all of that stuff at university. And then when I graduated with my degree in theater history, then I came out to Vancouver and went to a theater school out here, Vancouver, BC. Awesome. And, that, and, then, um, and then sort of became an actor from there. And as I've often said, the, um, the irony of it is that because I went into a lot of musical theater roles as soon as I graduated from theater school. And for the next 25 years, a lot of musical theater, way more, way more musical theater than any other genre on stage and way more than television or film. And the interesting thing was, is that I wound up dancing far more professionally and getting paid as to dance, um, probably for much, much, much longer than I ever would have if I'd been gone into a career as a classical dancer, because that, you know, is generally over by 30 or 35 if you're really pushing it. And um, not only was I doing musicals till, you know, for whatever, but when I was 49 is when I started um, Maurice the Orangutan in the Planet of the Apes series, which was a huge movement um, undertaking, the largest movement undertaking of my life that I did for the next eight years. And um, if it wasn't for my movement, my dance background, everything, that would have been impossible. So it's just really nice the way it all worked together. But that's how I arrived as an actor into the business. I love how it all tied back in together. Yeah. yeah. And I want to take a little segue from the X-Files. Could you tell me a little bit about how, like, because I'm really curious about how you did Maurice. Like, how did you, how did that, how does that work? It's, it's like a huge story in and of its own. I mean, for all of us, you know, who, uh, each of us who played, um, the, you know, whether it's Andy Serkis playing Caesar, or me playing Maurice, or Terry Notary as Rocket, or Toby Kebbell as uh, Koba, or any of us, um, it's it's a comprehensive undertaking. So not only are you um, you are portraying the character throughout the psychology, the everything, the voice, the 
the um, just everything, all the movement, everything. So it's and it's a character of another species, and in my case, of another gender as well. So, um, so it was on a number of levels. I mean, it's a I won't go into the long story, but it, but really the the physical training and that I had to do for Maurice, the research that I personally undertook to get to know orangutans, and I based. Um, Maurice on a real orangutan, Tawan, um, who lived at Woodland Park Zoo, um, and uh, at, on his passing in 2017 was the oldest male orangutan in North America, 48. Um, a wonderful orangutan, just a, a beautiful, beautiful soul. One of the one of my one of the finest teachers I've ever met, human or any other species. So I based uh, Maurice on Tawan, and then yeah, the physical training was massive. The things that were required of us to do through the three films so huge just so huge so as i say it's another huge story but it was um, it was full on i can't imagine i i'm so curious i would love to like watch that you know what i mean let's see how that all works my curiosity that's but that's what you know why we do what we do also because i'm so interested in like what went into filming the x-files right which brings me back to the x-files and how did you get involved with the x-files karen the first role that I did was Madame Zelma on Clyde Brookman's Final Repose. And I don't remember very much about, I mean, I, you know, it was like, I knew the X-Files, fancy TV show, whatever, I get this part on it. I mean, it already had quite the buzz around it by season three. And um, I guess I was, that was like a one day role. And all I remember was, the only thing I really remember from the filming was um, uh, like when, when I got choked to death, like trying to find the way to tip the chair over backwards, like, and, and fall safely, stuff like that. So. <laughs> Um, that was, um, I just, va and I only vaguely remember that. So that was my first role on the show. Right. And then you went ahead and did Home. Yes. How did that come to be? Um, well, it was probably one of the strangest audition call outs that I've ever seen. <laughs> you get the audition thing call out that says that it actually, because you know, do they, they send out breakdowns and there'll be a character description. So it would be like, and it's, I think it said Ma Peacock. Um, woman with no arms and no legs who lives under a bed. And that was the first thing that I read. It was like, you've got oh, I do this. Like, that's just, you know, and, you know, said something I should have. Yeah, no, I mean, this is in a day when it was way before computers. So I don't have the original, um, you know, piece of paper with the, all the audition sides. I should have kept uh, it um, yeah. to see what the breakdown was and everything. Um, but um, so that's what it was. And then I went and got, you know, the sides and started to look and we're like, oh my God, this is, this is like, I was really, I was like, what the heck do you do with this? You know, <laughs> um, and I had, and I guess there was, yeah, I guess the audition sides involved, you know, the, the scenes under the bed and stuff like that. Like not, not that Mrs. Ma Peacock's in the, in the thing enormously, because she actually isn't in the episode very <laughs> much, but it's just a couple of resonant pieces. But so I had to audition with all those pieces. And um, I remember that um, it was up at North Shore Studios uh, in Vancouver, the auditions were, and I also remember, uh, it was like, what, how do you audition for something, uh, you know, a woman with no arms and no legs? So I did what I do for everything that's outside the bean like that, including Maurice or, you know, anything yeah. else, is I put on black spandex from head to toe and pulled my hair back, no makeup, and just went, well, in, as I was preparing for it, I, I mostly worked, and once again, thinking from a very um, movement or movement oriented in a way, I guess a movement impulse. Um, what I, the way I sort of went at it was to go, well, if I had, let's say I'm completely stuck like this and I can't help myself and I have no arms and no legs and all I have to communicate with or gesture with is like my upper body. So where does that come from so I remember sitting in the hallway at North Shore Studios waiting to go in for one of my first audition or second or third because there was four um, auditions ultimately and just like putting my arms hands arms behind my back and just sitting there um, like squatted in a corner against a wall and just going through the text and uh, that's where I found her voice from because I realized with a, um, a person who's that physically limited they're not going to have the the diaphragm capacity that you know I would as a as a walking person. So that that's where her voice came from. And that I'm hungry. I'm ready. It's just just from here. Just from here. Um, and so something that was actually very hard on the voice to do. But but I realized that that's all. That's really all the. Um, she didn't have a lot of oxygen or support to be able to get behind that. A lot of emotion. A lot of intent. A lot of passion. But not a lot of physical. Oh, 
you know so so i just sort of found it like that and then um and then i remember like probably for the first audition there was probably several other people there nobody else was in black spandex with no makeup i mean i don't i can't remember what people did but yeah. that was sort of always my go to for if it's totally beyond representing in any way then just go to neutral and um and then i had a second and a third and a fourth callback and it was at the fourth callback that chris carter um, came in. I think Kim Manners really wanted me. I, I think it's possible that Network didn't. I don't know. Or some, there was there was some sort of like a, eh, should we, should we, shouldn't we? And then so Chris Carter came in to break the stalemate and Chris said to Kim that yes, yeah, you, you know, I, I, and I may have been given some notes in the room on the day. Kim may have said something. Chris said nothing. Um, but um, uh, um, whatever it was, it was just, you know, so I guess it was just Kim just kept pushing me deeper and deeper into the direction maybe and probably into a quieter and quieter range i would have no, i don't mean uh like in terms of volume i just mean in terms of specificity and the intent like just sort of firing mrs peacock's energy through a pinhole <laughs> and, and ultimately that's kind of what we did yeah that had to be very challenging right now now go back to um mrs peacock's the voice yeah um <laughs> Now, did you did you did you introduce that to like Kim Mainers and all that, or did yeah, it's entirely part of it from the get go. And what was their reaction? Oh, well, they were just responding to the whole performance. So it wasn't a matter of like, you know what I mean. It wasn't like the voice wasn't separate from anything, and it wasn't a put on thing. It's literally, um, it's kind of like the way I've gone at everything, whether it's Maurice's voice or um, like in the last X Files, Chucky and Chucky and Judy and Judy. I'll find the physicality of a character where they um where they move from basically and then the voice comes from that for me like especially if it's going to be it's got to be something really defined so nobody ever said anything in particular about the voice it was just you know we went with the, it was the whole package deal <laughs> right right my my opinion with miss peacock you know everybody was kind of creeped out she was underneath the bed but the voice for me was i think that was a little bit more creepier was her voice and i'll you know? tell you this you remember at that convention when you watched watched home with us and then you like were instructing people how to do that voice <laughs> no i don't remember. Is that, Is that right <laughs> yeah ever since then i I terrorize him by doing that voice. Like he's like, All right, do you want to get something for dinner? And I'm like, and I'll do that voice. And be like, <laughs> he I, think it's, me. I think it's because it's like when you connect, like when you connect a voice to the whole, what, what, so it's, it's, um, and I think probably what's terrif terror, terrifying and terrorizing about it is that it is coming from this place of such, you know, like it, it, it's the only thing that Mrs. Peacock's got in a way to express herself and to connect with her boys and her passion for her boys or to keep out the outer world and say, you know, like, get the hell out of here. Right. Um, so it's like, just like, that's all she's got. Like, that's it. She's got her eyes and she's got, you know, like every, she, her whole passion and a very passionate character, like a, a huge character but firing through a pinhead which is where that voice which is so yeah. you know it, it's real tough on the vocal cords but um yeah. but that's where it comes from yeah um it, it, in that episode you know a big shout out to you know the actors that played your sons in that you know they were they you know i mean you they're they're all full in makeup but just they helped make the episode totally yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, what a, what a strange, odd, like what an odd family all around. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It was, uh, I didn't, and we didn't really, we didn't spend any, I didn't get to know any of them at all. Like we didn't spend any time together except filming because, um, uh, of course, when we were filming because Mrs. Peacock, um, because I had to have like, uh, there was like, sort of fake arms attached to that were being operated by wires so i basically walked around with um my the sfx team who were always like touching up the the piece over my nose and face or or taking my teeth and putting them in a little container for me to care because i i couldn't uh, i i was uh, cho choke on them like you would gag after 
having the teeth in for a couple of, of, of minutes. It would literally, the gag reflex would kick in. So basically somebody had to be there to watch, you know, the prosthetic and then the puppeteers had to, who for the arms had to walk around with me and the wires were hanging out the back of my gown and, and, um, or I was inside the little coffin box they built for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> to hide the rest of my body and um so so basically we were like this little entity walking around me and you know like four members of the sfx team and so i only met people like i i don't think i i mean i i only met david and jillian like on camera in the scene didn't even it's not like i could go and sit in a cast chair somewhere you know right. that wasn't gonna happen that's so funny. Nor, nor did anybody want to be around Mrs. Peacock, you know, offset, especially on the day we did the, the birth scene and stuff like that. And I remember yeah. going for lunch on the day that we did the birth scene. And um, so the gown was all covered with anyways, was blah, blah, blah. And people, people were already so nauseated by having filmed that scene that people didn't want to have anything to do with me or the, or, or the team for the rest of the day. So... But that often happens in prosthetic roles. It's like um, uh, w when there is some version of prosthetic or monster involved. I've noticed that on other things where, um, especially in prosthetic, um, not only does the work itself require such focus, not that Mrs. Peacock was a big prosthetic role, it really wasn't, but bigger ones that I've done when I'm sealed in latex from head to toe, that's difficult. Um, but people don't, you, they don't, they, but you're, you're, it's, it's like you're invisible to them. Like nobody else, it's totally different than showing up, um, you know, with your, with your face showing people just sort of go, that's that over there somewhere. They don't relate to you. And so as Mrs. Peacock, I, nobody related to me, like, you know, I mean, Kim Matters gave direction, but that was about it. So, so as lovely as the boys performances were and stuff, I never got a chance to really talk oh. with them or anything like that. Yeah. Interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with the coffin box and all that stuff? Yeah, it was that awful. It was terrifying. <laughs> yeah. It was terrifying. I mean, um, anybody with claustrophobia, like myself, um, would, it's basically what they had to do is, um, it wasn't just like a board I was lying on. They had to put the fake body on top of the board. So they built a coffin box that had to exactly fit my body so that it would be able to green screen disappear or whatever. This is the 90s, so whatever. I can't really speak to the technology then, but so it literally fit me. It was to, to the shoulders and it was oh. like literally to there. And it was a tight fitting coffin box that they shoveled me into. So that only my, my, my feet poked out at the bottom. So once I was in it, I was trapped, utterly trapped. There's absolutely no, like I, you would need a couple of people to get, and once they attached the wires and did this and that, it wasn't just like, okay, let's get her out. Let's pull her out. You'd have to undetach everything. So it was a good five or 10 minutes. Um, so, and, and then to be shoved under this bed with the mattress, like right there. And then they put blood drops in my eyes and there's a little pin light under there. And, yeah. and and a lot of time under under that mattress under that bed especially the first day and that was terrifying it was really it was just it was horrifying yeah. um, um and I've, I've mentioned this story before to people but i remember when they first got me in the box and i was like okay and then when they started to put me under that's when i went wait 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 wait, wait, wait a second this is like a real bed and like and the <laughs> was coming up and I was like it's, it's like um if anyone's ever had an MRI like imagine the MRI tube that goes to there and then you got to go in there for several hours it's just like no um no <laughs> so uh um so it was I was going under and I, I started to freak out and I remember Kim Manners coming over and going what's wrong and I went but it, it's like a bed it's like a real bed and the mattress is right there and he said what did you think it was going to be like like what, what? And I was like well, I thought it would be he said it's television. It's a bed. She lives. It's a woman who lives under a bed. It's a real bed. Uh. And off he went. And anyway, so I went under there and I remember the, the room was filled with atmosphere. The blood drops in my eyes. Everything was just miserable. And there was a boom operator who'd been left in, in the room with me. That's all there was room for in the room. And I remember, I don't remember who it was or couldn't, couldn't even see his face because it was all dark. It was pitch dark. Yeah. And I just remember whimpering under that bed and him going, it's going to be all right. You're going to be all right. You can do this. You got this. You can do this. And all day long, whenever they, you know, we do that. And then, you know, and, and I didn't get out of, from that position very much. Like, I, I think I maybe got a break after the first 
I don't know, two hours, oh, maybe goodness. something like that. So, so basically when they first pulled me out and Mrs. Peacock screams and loses her shit, you know, like she does, that was definitely me losing. That was like me yeah. releasing and letting out all the terror of um, like everything I was going through. And I remember at the end of that first day of filming, getting home to my little apartment in the West End of Vancouver and sitting at my little red kitchen table in a chair and just shaking. I just sat there drinking water and shaking for like, I don't know, four or five hours. It was like sort of like a mini nervous breakdown, but like I had to get over it really fast so I could go back and do more the next day. <laughs> so miracle I got you to come back again after that. <laughs> Well, I think there's, there's, there's harder things I've had to do, but definitely was um, um, on, on the fear side of things. It really, yeah, it pushed me, it quite pushed, pushed me to the limit. And I think also, Jim, I think when you talk about the, the, um, what's so terrifying in Mrs. Peacock's voice, I think that's part of it. Because what you're getting is the terror of, yeah. and, and I'm, not a, I'm not at all a person for um, uh, method acting, like get yourself into the terror and then just... Yeah. I'm not like that at all. I'm very much a person of you do the work, you go in, and then you got to know how to drop it and go to the craft services table, be a human being, like not just stay in some dark, oh, don't talk to me place or anything. I don't think there's, it's not necessary. But this one, this one, you know, it involuntarily pushed that thing yeah. to the, just a little bit. So when, um, when that episode was wrapped, it was all done and it kind of like premiered and you saw it for the first time, your opinion, your take on it. I had the script and um, I remember sitting in my little apartment on Hero Street there and there was a, a small television. I was mostly in theater in those days, so I didn't even... Uh, there, there would have been no way to record it. Fortunately, I didn't have a, a show that night. And I remember sitting there with the script in my lap and I went, okay. And the show started and I covered my eyes because I knew where the gory bits were. So that's when I didn't even see it. So I just, I was like, okay, I know it starts really bad, really bad. Okay. And now, okay, now I can watch for a while. I was like, oh, here comes another yucky bit. Close my eyes, close my eyes, where at the script. And I did that through the whole episode. So I didn't see a great deal of my own stuff either. <laughs> Yeah, your whole, yeah, your whole part was the ucky bits. <laughs> I, was, I mean, I think I saw a couple of, of scenes with uh, with Jillian and David, but um, um, a lot of the rest of it I missed. The whole birthing thing, the you name it. And as I say, not that Mrs. Peacock's in the show very much. She's not in a huge amount of it, but um, but I knew there was a lot of other gory bits in it too. So any anywhere there was a gory bit, to my estimation, to my like you know, weak stomach, I was just sort of, I would cover my eyes. So I did not see the episode through until we all saw it together at that kind of convention, which is what I told everybody at the convention that it would be the first time, first time I'd watch it through with my eyes open. And I did. And then I was amazed by it. I was just, um, as a piece of iconic filmmaking, I just thought it Absolutely. was like, blown away. I was just blown away. And I also realizing once again, going, Mrs. Peacock's hardly in this thing. Um, she's hardly in it, but this is a brilliant piece of like the, I was so blown away by the thing as an entity. I think it's a, a stunning film. I really, really do. And uh, it has commentary on commentary or questions. It raises questions on so many levels, like not just here, but there and there and there and there and where you just you really wonder at so many things it's very beautiful absolutely we thought so we, it was groundbreaking then and we still think it's pretty damn good <laughs> and 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 it's it's like you know a, a big big fan favorite you know everybody loves it to death yeah you know and now, I mean, I wondered for a long time, like why that might be, never having seen it through, um, just, in, just in the sense of like, well, why that one in particular? But now, since we saw it again at the convention, I went, oh, well, now I get it. This is an iconic piece of filmmaking. And as I say, it's like, it's not, it's not based on a, um, a shock factor. I mean, there's shocking things in it, but there's so much going on in it that it actually is like one of the finer, you know, 45 or 50 minute films that's ever been made. What Kim did with that, with the music, with, Glenn, you know, um, yeah. Glenn Morgan writing and all the Morgan brothers, it's just amazing what they did with that. So um, now I understand it because it's like, um, and I think it, it raises questions. It raises as um, pertinent questions today as it did 
what, 25, 26 years ago now? It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, not counting. Yeah. Not counting. Yeah. <laughs> so after that experience, <laughs> what was your first thought when they asked you to come back? Or did you ask to come back? Who started that for Chuck well, Judy? This is a good, this is good. So, okay, so we do home, right? And then, you know, time passes. And then um, I remember, so the next thing that happened, with that because it links it actually there's a direct link from home to chucky and judy a direct link right. and that is glenn morgan one of the two magic men yep. um magic men to me being chris carter and glenn morgan and a couple of years later glenn was doing a film and i was asked to audition for it and then i got a call back for the role and um i walked into back north shore studios and i walked into the room and this man stood up and he went karen i'm glenn morgan i went Glenn, we had never met. And so, you know, breaking all rules of auditions and stuff, we ran over and hugged each other. And because um, it was our first time meeting and sort of went like, can you believe, I guess it was probably, at that point it was maybe the mid 2000s. And, and we both sort of went like, can you believe like what happened with home? Like, can you believe like where it went to? Neither of us could, like we were both just like, so we blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so I did that film for um for with glenn and he was an absolute joy to work with it was just um i just heart and soul loved working with him and then a couple of years later he cast me in um a series a recurring role in a series he was doing here and then a couple of years later he cast me in another series he was doing in vancouver and i can say that with the film and with the first tv series the film, after we did the film, and I'm not going to start naming names of things right now for various reasons, but anyways, after we did the film, I sent him a thank you card at the end of it saying, it was so wonderful to work with you. The next time I work with you, may I please have a role where I don't, hmm, my children, because <laughs> both Mrs. Peacock and the character in this film um, had inappropriate relations with their children. So I actually wrote in this card, may I, will you please give me a role where I don't, hmm, my children. And um, so when we got to the next the TV series a few years later, he went, here you go. She doesn't, hmm, her children. I said, okay, thank you. And then the next series like, here you go. She, st she still doesn't, hmm, her children. I was like, good. And then Glenn said, uh, when we were on the third series, Intruders, he said, um, so what, what, what would you like to play? And I went, you mean I get to make another wish? And he said, yeah, but not like the last one. I said, okay, I'll make a wish. I want to play a man. And Glenn went, oh, you want to play a man? I said, yeah, I want to play a man. He went, okay. And that was around 2014-ish. So um, time passes, new X-Files thing comes back. And I got a note from Glenn one day, an email saying, um, well, I, I, we're trying to find a way to write you in with the role of a man. This is the first season, season 10, not 11 then. And, um, but it's not really happening. So do you mind auditioning for other things? I said, no. So I auditioned for about four roles. When they came back, I auditioned for about four roles. Didn't get any of them. And um, was like, oh, this isn't working. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, the following summer before season 11, I got not from Glenn, but from casting. They sent over some scripty thing, like pieces of script. And they said, um, this is from Chris. Um, Chris is wondering, would you do a test audition for, for this? And I looked at it, it's like, holy shit, this isn't a man. This is a man and a man and a woman and a woman. This is insane. <laughs> it was like, and so I, you know, and I, I instantly worked with Chucky and Chucky and Judy and Judy. It was like, and, we, and I was like, well, is this is like an audition or it's like, no, it's sort of more like a, a test, a screen test thing. So I did the full thing and sent my test in and yes that's all chris wanted to know was could karen indeed play exactly what chris had written for me little did i know that chris had gone out of his way to write all of chucky and chucky and judy and judy for me which is amazing so mm -hmm. it was so we, i was it, i was just my mind so that's how the link came so glenn had told chris that karen wants to play a man and then chris went well, we couldn't find anything for last season or whatever, you know, so he wrote this for me, which is just about the biggest gift that anybody, like I was floored. And then it was the most fun playing Chucky and Chucky and Judy and Judy was bar none, the most fun I have ever had on just about any project ever. It was joy and it was easy from start to finish. Absolute joy. Like just, 
like there's, you know, things like Maurice are incredibly rewarding. They took everything out of me and I would, I wouldn't change anything for the world. Um, other things have been amazing. I've had beautiful roles in musicals and stuff like that, but what is the most fun I've ever had? Chucky and Chucky and Judy and Judy. It was just like bliss from start to finish. Yeah. And then getting to spend that whole time with Chris and, um, I loved working with David Duchovny in particular. He and like the, the scenes between him and Chucky was so much fun to do. And, um, and Kevin, our director was, was wonderful, but, but finally getting to then spend the time with Chris, who is, he's the magic man. He's yeah. magic. I agree. We agree. Definitely. Yes. And he gave not only you a gift, he gave all of us a gift because we adore Chucky, Chucky, Judy, Judy. We adore it. When that, when that episode aired, yeah. well, aired, you know, um, after when we found out that you played Ch Chucky, <laughs> we had no idea. I was like, he get, didn't believe me at first. I did not. But I was like, no, get that, get the hell out of here, because it was so spot on. I was like, no, that's a dude, you know, that's a guy, uh, nope. you know. And then I went, you know, back to Google and stuff, and I was like, holy yeah. shit! I got to tell you, you nailed it, out of the park. Thank you, Jim. Well, what was amazing to me about all this was um, that because. Um, like when I had done my audition for Chucky and all I did was I, I, you know, I put water in my hair and greased it back and went ee, with an eyebrow and got a $5 mustache from Bizarro Novelty and some glue and stuck it on <laughs> and, you know, sideburns and some whatever. And, and I did this audition like this. So, and then I thought, oh, well, when we go to do the, um, when we actually go to do the filming, I'm sure they're going to want to you know, do something a bit more sophisticated than that. But I went to um, Bill Terizakis, God bless him. He's yeah. gone. Yes. So sad, but God bless that beautiful, beautiful man who I've done many shows with. Anyways, Bill, the Bill was in charge of this. And when I got to Bill, I'll never forget going to Bill and going, okay, Bill, because we had done, as I say, several projects together before. I said, so where are we going with this one? And Bill went, we're going to do almost nothing. And I said, what do you mean we're going to do nothing? He went, I want to lay it bare so you can just do your thing. He said, so he said, I don't have much plans. He said, I said, well, what about, I'm going to, I'm going to have a wig, aren't I? He went, nope. I'm going to grease your hair back just the way, just the way you did for your audition. I said, well, do I get a beard or something? He was like, nope, you get a little mustache. I'll get you a better one than the one that you did the audition with, but, but uh, you get a mustache. And then he said, the only other thing I'm going to give you is um, I'm going to give you a little bit, I'm going to give you a little bit more of a prosthetic earlobe because my earlobes are quite small. So he literally crafted the teeniest extra bit of earlobe. Oh, and amazing. Got, like literally just that. And then the teeniest little bit of sideburns so that if the sideburns weren't painted, they were real. But any everything else was exactly what I did in the audition. In other words, getting into the Chucky makeup took I was in the FX trailer for, I don't know, maybe 25 minutes. Wow. Maybe, you know, to get the, wow. the glue on. Yeah, maybe about 25 minutes getting the earlobes and the this and, you know, the hair greased back. And then, I don't know, let's push it to 40 minutes. I don't think it was, it was meticulous, perfect work, but he laid it bare so that it would be my face, my voice, my performance throughout. So the one was not disguising. There was no... Um, there was no bells and whistles. It was like, so I say all of that to go after the show aired. I was like, well, I think people, I was very proud of the work and I thought, well, this is, this will be very, I think this, this people should quite enjoy my, what floored me was nobody believed I was Chucky. And yeah. I, I was writing to Chris. I was emailing Chris going, Chris, Chris, there's reviews out talking about who like, me as Judy and like who's the guy who played Chucky like this, this, I said we didn't even put me we didn't like I'm not even impressed like we're in nothing <laughs> Chris was just laughing and laughing and laughing and it blew my mind and actually eventually I got pissed off because I thought oh well come on this is stupid people like this is me this is completely an acting job totally acting job you know like we're not like, give me a break, you know? Okay, so I had a little bit of padding under my shirt, like that, like literally a, a, a yeah. fat pad so that Chucky would have a bit of a belly so I didn't have to act the whole belly. Um, but that was it. I'm going like, it was my hands. It was like my Karen hands yeah. that we put Band-Aids on. It wasn't even like, you know, like there was there was no hair on the knuckles or it was just like, it was me. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I, I had to, I really howled because I went, well, and Chris, I remember Chris writing something like, well, that's the highest compliment. And I thought, oh, forget compliment. I at least like, if I'm going to do work like that, I'd like people to realize it. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. But we now, know now. We had no idea, no, really. None, and it was just, it was, it was a. I, I've watched it so many times, and I'm like still blown away. I was like, "Shit, man, how do you do that?" You know, and it's like, how do, how do you get your voice like that? You know, it's, it's really easy. I can go in and out of Chucky quite easily now to get his exact energy i have to get on the mustache and like now basically because i have to get into the chucky and otherwise it's just sort of just like hinting at chucky but as soon as i you know put the hair back and get yeah the mustache on and he's right there he's just <laughs> yeah. wow I like i just you know? have to, it's like getting inside his energy once again it's just like and so basically for me like even when um, like I was doing a couple of fun ones for a, a little fundraiser last week yeah. where I just popped in out of Chucky for it. And um, I remember when I, because I hadn't visited Chucky in a year or two or something, and I put, did my hair back and went, okay, okay, I'm still not, like, I don't know if I'm in the right range yet. But as soon as the mustache went on, then I went, oh, there, it was like, oh, there he is. <laughs> and it's like, and Chucky, Chucky, um, when he's not being careful, swears like a trooper. So, um, like he's got a he's got a potty 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 mouth. So I have to be careful not to go in. If I go into Chucky, then the language will become blue very quickly. Oh, oh, the blue for it. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> right. And a big shout out to Judy. You know, um, crazy Judy. the crazy Judy. <laughs> God, that was some freaky stuff. You know, I mean Pretty it was. Cool, I think. I mean, it's like, I mean, like, like a character like that, who like that, um, and especially like, like nice Judy and mean Judy, uh, nice Judy and nasty Judy. Yeah. So totally, it was, it was quite, um, and, and once again, that's like finding where the character moves from. And like when I was setting all four characters, finding all four characters for myself, when I had to do the test audition, because I, I basically walked around in my living room going, okay, well, where does that? Um, like working with the script, I learned the script cold for each character. Like I make sure it's like word perfect. And then once I've got that, then go, well, where does that character, where does their impulse come from? And um, and I knew I had to be have a very clear physical impulse for each of the characters. Because not that we'd be going back and forth. Well, I might be going back and forth between Chucky and Chucky on the same day or Judy and Judy on the same day. But I never had to do four on the same day. But still one wanted the energy to be clear. So, um, so the vo voice once again had to be clear. And um, like with the Judy's, um, I sort of, it, obviously with nice Judy, she was scared shitless of everything, of the whole world, and in particular her sister in the corner of the room. So I fe really felt myself like moving around my living room, like just, I don't want, I, I, I'll go that way, but I'm going to go very, very carefully. And so the, and so her voice automatically went up there. And so it always felt like, nice Judy would enter the world very carefully from the side and then when I got to her sister nasty nasty Judy was just like you want me you know you want me who else do you want like there was, she was just like take me like yeah. I'm yours and and especially going when she with the scenes with Scully like you know yeah. just, like that like just like full on you know chucking the the, the, yeah. duke the spoon and stuff like that and um, so basically I felt like uh, Nasty Judy just led from the chest, like led from the cleavage, basically. Like she just led from the cleavage. And actually when we did the costume for that, same thing as I'd done at home, I asked, you know, we got it because wardrobe went with me on this all the way. The designer went with me on this all the way. So we got a push up bra and just like I'd done at home, I got some old men's socks and balled them up into either side of the bra just to make as much cleavage as possible but in a really sort of crass way you know like not a, a nice way like yeah. i just so we did that we used like balls up men, men's socks and just sort of went just like judy would like basically um you know so just so she would just go just like she would do in the in in the institution she'd probably just get some socks and shove them in there and go yeah you want me come on you know yeah, that was awesome. I can't imagine what that was like, the scene where you had to throw the stuff at, at a Scully. How did that, how was that scene to film? Well, it was really fun because I didn't have to throw it. <laughs> I mean, I did that part. 
But the thing is, is if you don't want um, um, to spend an entire day on takes of something, especially with someone who doesn't have a good throwing arm, <laughs> me, um, and this stuff had to land <laughs> exactly like Kevin, our wonderful director, Kevin wanted the dookie to land in exactly this place on the window. Ah. And, the, and so, um, so we shot my stuff and then uh, God, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but God bless our wonderful props master. He was called in to throw the dookie. And uh, <laughs> so that was like, you know, cutaway shots. And I remember Kevin going, no, uh, oh, get it. But he was a good thrower. He was a good dookie thrower. So he was a bit closer to the window than I would have. I That's a been. title for you. Yeah. Good dookie thrower. <laughs> and, uh, but I re we were all howling. We were killing ourselves laughing because Kevin would be like, ah, I just like it to run down the window a bit more. And then they'd have to clean the whole wall and the window and everything. And it was splattering a bit. But if it had actually been me throwing it, the room would have been covered and we'd never been able to use the room again. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had to be there for all of that. Having Dookie thrown at her. I can't I mean, imagine. The glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. So we know that you didn't like scary shows. So you probably weren't an X-Files fan before the convention but after you watch that have you have you watched any more x-files i watched all of season 11 <clears throat> pardon me i want i definitely watched all of season 11 um because more to, more to the fact is in the 90s i was always on stage doing musicals eight shows a week so um and i didn't have like a vcr any way to record things so and just a little tv um so um i basically didn't watch tv Aye. or I'd watch TV once in a while or on a, on a Sunday night or a Monday night, depending what was the dark night for whatever show I was doing. So I didn't watch any of the original series along the way. And then, um, but then once it came back, then I did watch all, all of season 11 and really, really enjoyed it. And I especially enjoyed the episode um, with the little robots. Um, oh yeah. The yeah. Title the one that has that bizarre once again. Yeah. Glenn, you can't say yeah. a lot of letters and numbers. Yeah, you can't say yeah. that. Title. It was another really <laughs> iconic little piece of, of of filmmaking that I found like just quite fabulous. I really yeah. enjoyed it. the, the comedy. It was it was like it was outside the you know there's hardly any nope. talking. Yeah. It was like a, an iconic little film unto itself over here somewhere. Um, and uh, anyways, it just really appealed to. I mean, I enjoyed everything that season, but that one, for whatever reason, turned out to be my fav my personal favorite. I just made me laugh. Yeah, right. it's definitely different. Um, and other shows, in other shows, I've noticed that you've played a doctor quite a few times. No, I know. Yeah. <laughs> there's well, there's another, there's another show that you did play in, which she enjoys yeah. i zombie oh i zombie oh yeah that gosh you know um it was just on that for those for a couple of episodes and then we really they wanted me to stay like they but i we, we were filming war for the planet of the apes at the same time oh wow and so war for the planet of the apes couldn't free me up it's like it was like because it was a crazy filming schedule and i was actually going back and forth between war for the planet of the apes i zombie and then did I do Bates Motel that fall as well? Anyway, some, it was like a bizarre combo of things. And I zombie, I zombie wanted me for another episode, but um, we couldn't work it out with the War for the Planet of the Apes schedule. So then they had to kill off that character, which was too yeah. bad because I love that character. Yeah. And I think, I think that character would have had um, a considerable more time on the show. Well, I don't, who knows? I can't say that. Right. right. It was a fun character and it was set. And once I'd done the first two episodes and they wanted me to come back, then, you know, I would have happily done more of it. But when they couldn't work it out, then they decided to kill, they had to kill me off because they had to move on. They couldn't wait like for a whole other year to yeah. know what they were doing. So. Well, the episode, the, the episode that you started in, uh, you know, on iZombie, we were watching it and all of a sudden, yeah. you know, I, know. I paused it and I'm like, holy, that, that's Karen, <laughs> yep. you know? And I was like, good God, she does everything. Yeah. You know, that's <laughs> so funny. Well, at least there, <clears throat> pardon me, there is where I, I actually look more like myself than, you know, in a, in, a, in a lot of other things I've done at times. But I've definitely noticed that 
over the last couple of years, I tend to, since the last Apes movie, I guess, well, no, just since Chucky, I guess, but since 2018, it was like 19, 20, 21, I've, I just, t I tend to get, play more roles where um, you can recognize my face like more. Uh -huh. And um, and this doctor thing that you mentioned, that's, that's floored me. I mean, I had doctors at different times and yeah. a certain part of me, a certain part of me goes, okay, I get the, um, I get like getting sort of regularly cast as authority figures in some way. Cause if, you know, you want, if you want the wicked witch of the West in a suit, then yeah, I'm a good person to come to for that. Like where, or the evil queen where the buck stops here and, you know, like that's a, that's just yeah. something I can do. And, um, um, but the, but the medical thing in particular has really floored me. Um, I love my character of, um, of Dr. Pelton on Snowpiercer, and we just finished our, our third season of the show. And so I've now done, I think probably like, oh my gosh, maybe 28 episodes of it or something. So, and I love, doc, I love Dr. Pelton because she is a, a doctor who was, like, she was a war vet. She was in Afghanistan and la la. And she's just like in, in the trenches. Yeah, let's get her done. You know, whatever it takes to do this, to do that. She's not fancy. Um, and she's quite um, ironic and sort of, uh, uh, you know, she's got a, just a sort of a eh, sort of sense of humor and, and she kind of slides through. It's like, yeah, well, if the wind's blowing this way, yeah, I'll go that way. Eh. She's got a heart, but she'll, you know, she's, she's a bit of an operator too. So I love playing Dr. Pelton, but what floored me was, um, at, in one way, was playing the nurse on the good, the um, nurse uh, Petringa on the good doctor for a couple of seasons and head nurseman. I understand that fierceness and stuff, but medical stuff for me, like actual medical stuff. And on the good doctor, like the stuff you've got to do medically is really sophisticated. It's going at a lightning speed. And, a lot, and I got thrown in on the deep end with that one on the episode can't remember the name of it, a quarantine, and where people were being rushed in during a pandemic, <laughs> an <laughs> of an epidemic. And so we were working on people and, and it was, anyways, so I, I, everything went fine for like, I wound up being uh, very good at doing all the medical stuff and selling it, you know what I mean? Like, so, but I have to say that the weirdest thing to me is playing medical roles when you have to work with medical equipment because I feel like a deer in the headlights. I totally do. I just be like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and I've got to be a doctor in <clears throat> several of the things. I think even once on Stargate, I was a brain surgeon or something. Yeah. And that, I had a map. Did you see? I, I, I had the mask on and came in just to do this one seat seen whatever and I remember being so bad so bad with getting the implements that behind my mask I was I was apoplectic with laughter like I was so bad it was like the only time I've ever done that on because I'm I'm sort of a 500 percent worker doobie who's like like uber professional about everything that's the one time I can remember I went I was so bad at this I can't and I was crying with laughter <laughs> and I finally managed to get enough of it but it was like that was like probably like the worst thing ever, but I, I'm just, I'm terrible with medical equipment. I'm just awful with it. I remember saying on The Good Doctor many times to people, it's like, why isn't this a cooking show? Give me a good stew to make or, or something like that. <laughs> I, give me catering for a hundred and I'll be in there chopping and dicing. It's like, I, I know my way around a kitchen. Um, I know my way around serving, you know, a hundred people. I've done years of waitressing, but, but this medical stuff. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you must be better at it than you think, because they keep giving you those kind of roles. I know, and when I see them on screen, that's what floors me. Like when I see my work on The Good Doctor or on other shows where I've had to work with medical stuff, I go, I totally buy that. I believe it. I look like I totally know what I'm doing. I do not look like someone who is a deer in the headlights, going, "Oh my God, what what are you doing?" <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Of course, now when I watch those things, I'm going to think about how you feel while you're filming right. it. And especially while, let's say, you're playing a character who, who's totally in charge and knows exactly what's going on. So the acting job for me in those circumstances is huge, where I'm like, yep, or just, I mean, and I mean, in all ways, I'm like, okay, I don't know how this is going to go, but <laughs> just dip in there and do it. And then uh, it'll be like, and everybody buys it on set too, has bought it on set. It's like, nobody thinks I'm I'm ready to lose my shit inside. They can't tell. They just think I'm really good at, at doing this. And I, but inside, I've been flipping out. <laughs> Challenging. <laughs> right. You think it was right. a cooking show? <laughs> That's so funny.
You also starred in something that I quite enjoyed. It wasn't very popular. Um, you were in Tooth Fairy. Oh my God! <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you told me that. Yes, I because I, I I found that I saw that I found that at I was like, holy shit, she was in it. That's right. I have that movie, and I quite enjoy that movie. Horror fans. Well, not a horror fan. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That film is the one film that I wish I had never said yes to doing. I was on it for one day, and uh, but it taught me a lesson. Um, so I was only on it for one day to film the Tooth Fairy when she goes like flying with the axe and whatever yeah. and da 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 da. da. Um, and the prosthetic thing. I think that was my fourth full head prosthetic, and by that time I was pretty flipped out at the whole prosthetic head fitting process and stuff like that. I took it because I needed a job, whatever at that point. Um, but I took the job and then I got the script. And as I was reading the script about what this tooth fairy did, I went, Oh my God. Um, I don't feel like I, I tried to get out of it. I actually tried. I was like, and my agent at the time, not my current agent, but my agent at the time was like, Oh, you got it. And I was like, well, this is, I can't, this is like, this is to me, it was gratuitous. There was a lot of, from what I saw in the script, it was going to a gory, gratuitous place. That was just, so, and then, anyway, so then I had to do it. I did, uh, I did the day of filming and actually the day of filming wound up being a lot of fun. Not because, I mean, I was, I was like, I don't think I slept the night before. I was really upset going to do it because I felt like I was, um, I was doing something that was against my own morals in terms of like right. that or being yeah. seen by children. Gratuitous horror, not my thing. Right. So. But then we get there and the kid that I was working with that day, the, the five-year-old kid, oh, he was having so much fun. So every time they push me down the hall on the cart well, ah, with the ax and stuff, he, and then yeah. they, they'd go, ah, ah, and they were, they were throwing the blood, fake blood pools down on the floor. And he was having such a good time. He was just ah, ah, like, he was having such a good time being killed. Such a good time ah. play acting at that. And, the, and then, and then he was having such a good time that he was just laughing and laughing. Yeah. The t they wouldn't have even called cut and he'd be just lying there, just laughing and laughing. So we'd all be laughing. And then Uwe had to say like, no, 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 we don't, you know, we can't, there's no laughing until after cut. So it wound up being actually kind of fun to do and just ridiculous. But even after that, and then that was just that day. And the, But I always felt kind of, just kind of a bit dirty for having done it um, yeah. just because of, and it, but it made me from that time on, I went, I will never do um, a horror that has gratuitous something or uh, that is horror for the sake of horror. I will never do that again. It's got to have something underneath. And it also <clears throat> helped me inform me so that I went, when I started to have the chance at possibly doing um, levels of stuff, performance, mo motion capture or stuff for, um, right. um, any for some fancy video game stuff if they were war or violence oriented i will i will not do that like i won't do them just stuff that is games for um that it is it's just not and i don't have people who enjoy them and everything that's that's great but it, for me it just doesn't sit well in my soul because i i wouldn't watch it and i wouldn't want um a child by mistake you know like seeing yeah. that somewhere and being part of that so that's all I felt. No, I know. And then there was Mrs. Peacock, but I, but that's a, it's like, it's on a different level. That's a different totally level. different level. Yes. That's yeah. Right. So that's my, so I took Tooth Fairy off my resume. It's not, it went off my, re well, my, the resume has to get selected as the years go on anyways, but, but it, it was never on my resume. Never put it there because of that. Interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> but, but I totally enjoyed it. I, you know, it was one of those things where I got the movie a long time ago. I go, this is probably going to suck. And then yeah. I put it in and I watched it. I go, that wasn't that goddamn bad. Holy <laughs> I was like, wow, that was actually pretty good. There's different kinds of horror. There is gore horror, you yeah. know, and there's horror where you don't have to have a lot of blood in it. You know, it's all right. about how it's shot and it's all about the script and the acting you know and that's the way that one worked out yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool that's good yeah. cool. obviously i never saw it i just on the page it seemed yeah it was it was very it was very you know i mean i had a couple scenes here and there but on on a on a real uh gore horror yeah, level it, it was very mild absolutely yeah. mild cool. you know? that's cool 
Well, I mean, it's like because you can do when things are like psychologically horrifying and thrilling, like that. Right. I find that very, very interesting. Like that's yeah. that's interesting where you, you know, um, and um, so in that vicinity, that's uh, that's very interesting. But yeah, it's it's like one not knowing one. I just felt like because you never know where it's because on the page that one was like, oh, my God, it was not, you know, it wasn't hinted at. It was really graphic on the page. Right. If you get a script and you look at something, you go, okay, this is really graphic on the page. As an actor, you've got to make that choice then. You don't know, you know, how it's going to wind up. Now, mind you, another movie that I did that went the reverse way, um, and once I'll leave that alone, but it but it was psychologically really interesting, horror that way. And then when they test marketed it in front of 14-year-old boys, they were like, we want more gore. So suddenly they had more budget to bring it back to gore the thing up and um, it ruined, it absolutely ruined what otherwise would have been, I think a psychologically beautiful and thrilling film, but I'll let that, that one be. That was another reverse experience that I had where I had a wonderful right. film. And then, you know, producers and whatever went, oh yeah, they test screened for 14 year old boys who all went more blood, more gore. And yeah. so Suddenly, yeah. it was a low budget film, they had no money. Suddenly, they could come up with like literally three weeks more filming stuff to add a bunch more, you know, like uh, decapitations and slashing and everything. And so, I've never seen that film either because I was so I was so angry at what um, you know the producers did yeah. to it, ruining a filmmaker's um, really what otherwise could have been a really cool film. Anyway, yeah, right. It, it example like. John Carpenter's back in the 70s, his movie, Halloween. Um, now that movie is, it's a masterpiece. But if you, when you watch the movie, there's like almost zero blood in that movie. Yes. You know, you, there's a time for it. Right. There's a time for it and there's a time not for it. You know. That is actually, that's actually the, fir the first and maybe the only, um, my, my boyfriend in grade 12 took me to see Halloween and um, <laughs> late seventies. And, uh, um, and we, we went, we went to see it and uh, it, it, and like it, well, I remember, I remember that it was a scary experience, but it was not one where I went, right. Oh my God, I didn't have the Karen reaction. It was yeah. a right. film. So like that, that's like, that's really interesting. That's, that's a really yeah. interesting thing. Yeah. Is that, it's more powerful when when they stick to a you know what I mean like they 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 uh, save the cherry as it were for like like just use it here or here or here because you've exactly. got everybody. it's it's just a way more interesting thing way more interesting I think I think the same thing happens with home in a way so when Mrs Peacock just comes out and there's horrifying things like that it is it's terrifying but um um they're 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 um, affecting you on a psychological level that is uh, very specific and they're not right. it's so wonderful about home too with the music and the you know the the wonderful johnny mathis song and all yeah. that. but it's on that same um having like uh where, where the audience is yeah but but if you actually went well how much gore are you at or or whatever you're actually looking at very little very 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 yeah little. home had home had very little gore but what home had was it had your mind right. thinking, right. you know, I mean, the scenes and everything, you knew deep down in your mind what was going on and what happened, right. you know, that's you what was, your imagination. Right. That was the disturbing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's why that episode is, it's just, it was so beautifully done. You do, you know, you, I, my opinion, this is my opinion, people. <laughs> I think gore covers up a lot of stuff. You know, right. that's my opinion. Yeah, that's exactly the way. That's exactly what I feel about it. And it, as I say, like when you're I mean, I'm so glad to hear this about something like the Tooth Fairy, because as I say on the page, once I like I got the part and then I got the script and then and then you read the whole thing. And you go, oh, my God, what am I getting involved in? And you can't see that as an actor, like where a director or an e director and editor may ev eventually make very sophisticated, good decisions. Yeah. Um, or I would say something that was on the page that was not um, full of stuff, and then producers go away and go, "Yeah, let's score it up." So it's it's a it's it's a toughie to know where people are going to go. But yeah, I think when when stuff is covered up, it's just, it's just, it's so crass. It's cheap and it's thin. It doesn't have levels, and I don't think it has ultimately staying power. It's um it's like you know it's like eating three chocolate cakes or something like that, rather than 
you know, one slice of one good one or something. It's just like, yeah. no, I don't know. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Well, we thank you from the bottom of our heart for Absolutely. everything that you've done. Absolutely. Oh, totally. I'm, I'm uh, so, so uh, I'm with you guys on this. I'll be cheering all along the way. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how it all comes together and everything. So fantastic. And hopefully just see you maybe by next spring or something at another con. Oh, yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, that would be or, great. Or, you know, if we're open, you can come on down to the museum. You got to get, well, the, 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 the right building has to arrive. Right. <laughs> it will. It, it will. will. Yeah. And I want to hear about that. The moment it does, the moment that magic building arrives, I want you to eat. Don't like, there's a bit, send me an email. And say, yeah. We, when we, when we finally yeah. get that, yeah. there is a bunch of people we're going to message an email before everybody else. Yay. <laughs> cool.